Welcome to season three of You're Not Alone with Townsend. My name is Townsend, and if you've followed my journey, you know that I'm not only a musician, but I'm also a mental health advocate. I use my platform to help spread awareness, love, build community, and simply help people feel less alone in their struggles. In the last couple of years, I've had the chance to interview people from all over the world about a huge variety of mental health topics, and I cannot thank each of you enough for helping us continue to shine a light on the world. Every other week this season, we're bringing you the best interviews we've had. Make sure to like and follow this podcast if you're enjoying it. And if you want to keep up with everything we've got going, follow us on socials at Townsend T Music. Hope you enjoy. What is up, guys? Welcome to this episode of You're Not Alone with Townsend. It is season three. I am so excited for this fresh new season. The guests that we have are just so good. I say that every week. Today, we're going to be chit-chatting about Justin McRoberts, which, crazy enough, a lot of my followers had messaged me and were like, you have to have this guy on. He's so inspirational. And I was like, who even is this guy? No, I'm totally kidding. I'd heard the name. So I was looking into it and Basically, he's a singer songwriter, a pastor, a speaker, a writer, a podcaster, a coach. Like, I just stopped after those things. Like, I think it just continued to go. And after about page three of your discography, I stopped. Fantastic. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Let's, you, you, you and a lot of other people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining. I know you're crazy booked, so we'll go ahead and hop into it. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So who is Justin McRoberts? I know I gave away a little blurb of all the things yeah. you may touch, but but how would you explain yourself? Um, so it's got a couple answers depending on the angle um, and depending who's asking. So functionally, uh, I'm an artist. It's probably the, the biggest, the, the best big word to put an umbrella around the things I do. Uh, I'm an artist and I'm an artist in the way um, Seth Godin describes art, which is to say art is anything that uh, I create, anything you create uh, that forges a connection between people. So I write books. So there's an authorly thing there. I host a podcast. There's a podcasting thing there. I coach um, and in all the things that I do, I lead retreats um, and all the things I do, I, my hope is to forge a connection between people and people or people in themselves, or people in the divine. So in the broadest sense, I am an artist. Uh, I also am a dad. I've got two kids. Uh, my son is 13. My daughter is six. Um, then there's the more existential piece of it. So who am I? Like, those are all things I do. And so that's how folks tend to recognize me. Artist, dad, that guy. Um, at the root of things, I am a beloved one of the divine that holds all things together. That's really the at the core of the question of identity, um, all of the things that I do that uh, help people around me recognize who I am are rooted in my belovedness in the divine. So Ooh, that's cool. who I am. If that wasn't a perfect answer, I don't know what it is. It's like you wrote that out. That was beautiful. I've done some writing. You yeah, should so be an author. That's, that's <laughs> one of the things. It's one of the things on the list, Townsend. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. No, I'm totally kidding. You are so well worded. I appreciate that for sure. And everything that you write, you do these little motivational blurbs on your socials, which we'll get to in a little bit. But sure. I love it just so much. I'm always looking for people to help spread light and love. And I consider myself the thing. I felt this huge calling to build a community. And so I have this yeah. platform for music, but I was like, man, I could do more. Like people cool. need love and to know that they're not alone. So I appreciate yes. others. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you're doing it. Absolutely. So what? let's chat about what got you into sharing your story and your encouragement. Like why take this leap of faith? Um, in the broad sense. So um, how do I do this? So I, again, there are several answers to that question. So I, I, I did uh, a fair amount of theater when I was a kid. So beginning my freshman year or so, um, I liked being in front of people and liked uh, presenting stories. Um, that sort of parlayed itself over time. Um, and that's been my vocational journey. I think for the most part is, is I very rarely like done a thing and then quit and moved on to something else. They all, it, this sort of evolves. So yeah. I have liked, uh, in high school, I really enjoyed, um, doing theater. My, my drama coach was a guy named Tom Wills. And there's some stories about him in a book called it is what you make of it was so he was an he was an amazing drama coach because he wasn't just helping uh, high school kids like me learn the skill like of stage work and memorization but he really did 
help us find ourselves in the stories we were presenting. And so when he would cast us in plays, they would almost always be plays for the most part that were really meaningful to him. And he helped us to, to couch ourselves in those stories. So we wouldn't just memorize them. He would teach us like, this is why this is important. So, I mean, we did Shakespeare for sure. We did, you know, Midsummer Night's Dream uh, and, um, and um, Much Ado About Nothing. But we also did plays like The End of the World uh, as we know it, which is, I cannot remember the writer's name, but it was about nuclear deproliferation. And his point was to invite kids into the story of foreign policy and nuclear history um, and we, I was cast as a lead in a play called Black Elk Speaks. Um, and his, his intention was to help us catch ourselves in story of, uh, of Black Elk and the Native American experience in America. I fell in love with the way, I mean, I didn't, I, I say it now, I wouldn't have said it at 18 cause I was oh, sure, of course. Yeah. But I, I fell in love with the way it felt to be in someone else's story and to invite and draw people into a meaningful story. Again, that's Seth Godin's whole thing about art. We were forging a connection. We were connecting with our own nation's history. We're forging with the, 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 the experiential history of people that aren't like us as a bunch of white kids. And then we were do, they were helping invite other people into those stories. And I really, I fell in love with that process. I fell, and as I became more conscious of my own story, because that's the thing about, being a kid is you don't really, I did not feel like I had a story to tell, right? Right. Which is probably good or I wouldn't be living it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'd, be, I'd be too too in love with, that's a problem now, I'm too in love with my own story to live it. Um, but I, like by the time I learned that I was living in a story um, and noticed my own story, it, it was a bit of a natural um, jump to like, okay, what do I do with this now? Well, I, I'll write some songs or I'll write some poems or I'll start storytelling. So I came to it because I was telling other people's stories and I liked what story does in terms of forging connections with people. And the more conscious of and happy with my own story I am, the more interested I am in doing that for other people with my own story. Yeah, that's so cool. So it just all comes down to like forming that community and that that bond between everyone storytelling. Yeah. Me. Gosh, Especially. have you reached out to him and said, listen, you changed my life. Oh yeah, we talked. I mean, Tom and I stayed in touch for a really, really long time, and um, he, he, yeah, he's he was very, very conscious and very aware of of what I had done with the tools he handed me. That's awesome. I love it. There was something that you posted on Twitter that I just loved. Is it cool if I read it? Yeah, please. All right, let's do it. So you said mourning does not simply become dancing; it must be planted in the soil of hope and good counsel watered with the tears of uncurbed grief, and then harvested by the choice to move my feet again. And I love that. I feel like so many of my listeners message me about mourning and about grieving. And we we have had counselors and therapists come on and discuss that process. So I think that's just so pretty. I love it. And it's so relatable. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. You yeah, post I'm, little blurbs kind of... like that all the time, which are just so inspirational. Thank you. Yeah, that that one comes from I'm 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 in the process of writing a a, a book with a dear friend of mine named Scott uh, Erickson. We're we're doing a book that it will be a prayer book. Um, we're calling in the low uh, prayers for seasons or prayers for dark seasons. But ultimately, it's about spiritual practices in like dark seasons or dark moments. And so, oh, so cool. all of it is angled at like what what does it look like to actually have a prayer life in the context of living with depression or like living in a long season of mourning. Um, that's where that one comes from. Oh, I love that so much. And like I said earlier, I feel like so many people can relate to that. When is that supposed to come out? When are y'all playing in that? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't remember. Yeah, <laughs> I, think okay, think I think it's like 2020. I think it's 2025 okay. at some point in 2025, maybe late 2024. I don't remember. I just did the work. Yeah, and that's it. I Somebody it else to... takes it. Yep. I they, we're doing it with Baker Books and uh, Stephanie, who's the senior editor over there, makes all those decisions. And okay. that's why she does that. Because even if I had decided that, I would probably forget. <laughs> You're like, I'm the writer, not the like keeping up with I, everything. Or... Nope, exactly. Yeah. Here's the here's the deal. I want to have you back on to discuss that one. 
I think mourning yeah. and grief and depression is huge, which again is why we, we do, do this that. thing. Hey, yes. speaking of that, while we're on that topic, you merge both mental health and Christianity, which I love. I have found so many Christians and people that are just Bible thumpers, for lack of a better term, they separate sure. the two, right? Yeah. And I've seen a lot of, to be honest, a lot of negativity on social media. Yeah. And I'd like to chat about that. How can we do better? And to put that in, to put it in layman terms, I have seen Christians come on and be like, listen, if you have depression or anxiety, it's a sin. You shouldn't have a sin. You should be able to pray those away. Are you enjoying this conversation? This project is funded by patrons and sponsors. So if you like what you hear and you'd like to help us continue changing lives in 2024, we would love to have you join the family. Reach out to us at townsendtmusic at hotmail.com if you'd like to be a sponsor or hop on patreon.com slash townsendtmusic to join the patron family. As a thank you, you're going to receive extra podcast questions and content every episode, discounts, exclusive content, and so much more. So join the family and let's continue changing lives. The the first thing that pops into mind here is... Um, Yes, there are, there is among the religious um, a, a can among some of the religious, including me, a hesitation around like mental health and mental health practices or me mental health offerings. What I do want to say is that in the mental health industry, uh, there's also a hesitation about religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we tend to do, and this is I don't tr I try not to do the big we all the time. Or very often because it gets me in a lot of trouble and yeah. I miss the big point. But th but this is uh this is I think important. We all like to protect the product we're selling. So uh it's less about the nature of religion or the or the nature specifically of Christianity. It's more about the way as Americans we like to find the thing that works and then sell it like it's the most important and most viable pathway to health. So we do that with if you know people who do CrossFit. <laughs> or you know people who because I'm a I mean I love CrossFit people so I get to give them crap too yeah of course like, as soon as you find anything that works for you one of the propensities we have as humans is to is one is like this is the way uh, th this is the way to health and wholeness I'll say wholeness instead this is the way to wholeness and flourishing as a human being uh, and then once we once we believe that uh, and it might, then we try to sell that to other people that's and that's a it's a pretty Western pattern. But the mental health industry does the same uh, as the religious industry. And the the goal isn't to get Christian, in, in my estimation, the goal isn't to get Christians to be less judgy about crap that they don't believe. <laughs> the goal is for any of us to let go of the need we have to corner the market on things that are about human wholeness. If it helps, then for God's sake, like let's help people with it. Yeah. And if it doesn't help, then it doesn't. And if it helps you, Fantastic. I love that. And if you can help other people with it, great. But the the arrogance with which we announce our own healing and the uh the self-righteousness with which we then try to sell the things that work for us, like that's the issue. What where I'm preaching on this and I apologize, but the, the, no, the place we miss the place we miss is like we make that about we make that about um therapists or we make that about like the the therapeutic industry it's that the nature of the nature of human souls as we've been trained by a very sales oriented western society makes uh products out of good things and then we lose the pathway together that's the long sermony piece so that's, what that's i'm what doing it, so what i'm doing is I, i'm not i'm actually not trying to um, I'm not trying to bridge a gap between mental health and my religious practice. I'm just trying to present myself as whole. Um, and part of my, part of my wholeness includes years and years of therapy off and on. Part of my wholeness includes, uh, exercise. Part of my wholeness includes certain religious practices. I would say this though, um, that because of the nature of the way I understand my religious practice, it's all housed under a spiritual development, uh, spiritual wholeness. Once again, you knocked that out of the park. That was fantastic. 
Okay, that answer was beautiful and I love it. So something that really just crawls under my skin and it might be because I, because I want to see people live their whole life. It, whether yes. that includes, like you said, you, you do yoga, you do devotionals in the morning, you do therapy. I think that's okay. And I am okay to preach that. Yes. And I have seen yeah. with my own two eyes on social media, people from churches and certain practices get on there and say, anything that you do that's outside of prayer is totally selfish and it's of human and it's a sin. And I'm just thinking, Oh my gracious. And I'm kind of like you, if it helps you and it is under the umbrella of Christianity and how, and those practices, I just don't see how it could be bad. I don't know. There's just such a tear between yeah, the well, two. A, yeah. The, the, some of the tension there is that, I mean, in theory, a, a healthy religious view of life helps provide a, like a discernment metric. In other words, like, uh, so it, it's, it is, it is, I think it's not a bad thing to say if it helps, then fantastic. Let's run with it. The other side of the coin is we're not always in, and this is the dark side of the coin. We're not always in a great place to evaluate what help means. So, yeah. um, one might even say at the beginning of a pretty severe drinking problem that it helps sure. that, that like I come home to the end of the day or whatever, the, that's the story we tell, like a little, like, you know, take the edge off. Maybe that's true. Um, what a great, what a, what a healthy religious practice can do for someone is to provide a metric for human wholeness in which, um, like we can evaluate the goodness of, uh, like of a certain practice, whether it's yoga or CrossFit, um, or, you know, silence and solitude. The, the line we cross is that we, we mistake the metric we're using, um, for a rule. Yeah. And in other words, like this is, so if, if, if the heart of the divine is for human wholeness and flourishing, that that's a thing you've learned in the context of your, your religious, you know, that's a, you've, you've established it with, with a religious lens, your religious lens isn't like, isn't the whole thing. It's a way you get to see other things. This is the way C.S. Lewis talks about religious faith and religious truth a lot. It's, it's, it's not like, you don't see the light. You, you see like the light illuminates the things around you. So when Christian folks, when religious folks make this mistake, it's we're, we've stopped paying attention to the world around us because we're, we're entranced by the light we're supposed to see by. And we become like, we become the cat that's staring at the finger as opposed to seeing the thing that the finger is pointing to. Yeah. And so we're, we're off by a smidge. We're, yeah. we're off by just a little bit. You're, you're not wrong. You're not wrong in saying like, I, I you know, I would like you to be, you know, if you are someone who's come to the knowledge of Christ and you're healthy and whole and you want that for other people, you're not wrong to want that to be true for other people. Right. Thing is, is like that, that experience you've had and what's happening in you in relationship to your own religion is pointing, is hopefully illuminating the world around you and not just trying to make people look like you. Anyways, that gets too preachy, but we become, we become the cat that's staring at the finger instead of following the point of the finger to wherever it's going. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great way to put it. Like we just need to pull back a little bit, look at the big picture. Yes. I feel like things would, things would go a lot better if we could do that. Absolutely. Amen. <laughs> so you've written a book called It Is What You Make Of It. Mm -hmm. What made you choose that title and even that topic to discuss? Um. So two answers to the question. The one is and the kind of the existential answer is I don't, I think it is what it is as a phrase is it's really problematic. Uh, <laughs> it's deeply problematic and it is an excuse for stuckness. Nothing uh -huh. is what it is. So if Rosa Parks says it is what it is, she doesn't try, she doesn't make a mess uh, and make a ruckus about where she sits on a bus and King doesn't lead marches. Like anything that's been truly redemptive comes from a place of like, let's change what is. Um, I think we mean it is what it is. I think we want to mean it is what it is as a, as a pathway to peace, but usually what it is, what it is uh, leads us to is a place of stuckness and quitting. Um, it also removes the, the, it actually steals from us a, a more nuanced understanding of the way the world works. In other words, um, nothing simply Nothing in American culture, let's just talk about the world you and I are living in, nothing in American culture simply like works the way it does. People who have had power 
have made decisions about how things work and that's why things are as they are. It's the all of the things, the, all the things, the political powers, or political systems, economic systems, religious systems, all of the all of these patterns have been set in motion on on the energy of human will. Decisions were made by people in power. I don't get to both complain about things being broken and say that things simply are as they are. Because what I've done now is I've removed myself and my power from the from the actual process of culture making and redemption. So all this, you know, we get to things like what you know, forty percent of the populace that can vote do, that can vote doesn't vote because it is what it is, and the system's broken, and I'm not going to participate. That kind of stuff drives me crazy. Nothing gets better. Nothing that matters gets better if if it is what it is. And we almost always say it is what it is in relationship to things we don't like. Very few of us come into a place of like, this is a glorious, magical moment. It is what it is. What we say is, <laughs> this sucks. I hate it. I wish it was different, but it is what it is. Drives me crazy. And that was why I wrote the book. It's like, yeah, let's, let's, I want to, I want to create some stories and some pathways to get people out of that stuck place. So the things that can get better do, because it only gets better if we make it that way. Man, I'm going to leave this inspired. I'm about to go make some things. Like, yeah, yeah. I feel like I need to go write a book and it's not going to be near as well worded as yours, but let's do it. It's going to call, it's going to be called, it's what it's. It is what it is. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Your recent, you. your most recent project kind of discusses work and rest balances. And I know this is something that I preach all the time. I talk about yeah. taking time to rest and how that's a huge, I mean, we talk about physical health, mental health, emotional health. I practice mm -hmm. it. I need to do better preaching it, or I need to do better practicing backwards as I yeah. do preaching it. Yeah. Do you find that this area is something that a lot of people struggle with? Yes. Uh, and uh, most and most of that has to do with permission. So in other words, we go back to the, the idea of wholeness. Um, it's, I think for a lot of us, and this is why I wrote the book, the way I wrote the book is it's less about, no one's going to say like, yeah, like work-life balance, this is the way we talk about it. Work-life balance doesn't matter. Or being a rested person doesn't matter. Or like, no one's going to say it doesn't matter. Like, everyone knows it matters. Uh, everyone can point at some sort of research study, like every, like everyone's on the same page in our heads. The thing we tend to lack is the sense of permission um, to actually live life that way. So what I try to do with the book, in, as, in essence, like the whole notion of it being about rest and work rhythms, that's kind of a head fake because um, it's not really about rest work rhythms. It's about rerouting ourselves in a more redemptive and fundamental narrative of humanity. Um, you are beloved of, you are a beloved one of the one who holds all things together. That's who you are. And if that's true of who you are, then the thing that matters is not what you produce in the world, uh, but who you are in the world. And if you're not experiencing and enjoying who you are in the world, and it doesn't matter what you've made, uh, I think that's the heart of the divine. And I wanted to, with the book, move away from like, let's find this tension, this tensious balance. How do I do enough work and get enough rest and answer the question underneath that, which is like, why do I make the decisions I make about what I do and what I don't do? And I think at the root of all these things, what we're doing is we're actually pursuing belovedness and belonging. What I want to know, when I want to know when I make a piece of work and when I put work in the world is I want to know, and <laughs> like some, yeah, sorry if this misses for you, but you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> What I want to know at the core of me, why I do this is because I want to know that there's something of goodness and value in me. That's why I do what I want to, that's why I do what I want to do. Even if I'm doing stuff for other people, we have to face this. Even if I'm doing stuff and I want to be helpful for other people, it's not just that I want to be helpful for other people. That's probably true, but no one is purely altruistic. Nobody. Right. Sure. Most of us, if, most of us are semi-conscious of this. I'm helping you and I'm doing helpful work because, because I want to be someone who is helpful. It's about who I'm becoming in the world. In the same way, when I if I if I'm someone who practices practices rest, what I'm pursuing is what part of what's going on in my soul is I want to know if I take my hands off the wheel and let go of my life that I'm going to be cared for because I'm beloved. In other words, my work is an expression of belovedness. My rest is an expression of belovedness, which means if I follow the threads of why I both work and rest, what I find at the core of both things is a deep desire to love and be loved. The way Parker Palmer puts it is that both work 
and rest. He says action and contemplation are rooted in the same place, which is the deep human desire to be fully alive. There will be no work-life balance. There will be no like productivity versus you know, rest you know, balance. There will be no hustle versus health. I want to know that I am loved. And if I don't know that I'm loved, I will either overwork or underwork. I will overrest or underrest. I just won't do any of it well because it'll be rooted in the wrong place. It needs to be rooted in the fact that I'm trying to experience my life as a beloved person while I'm alive. That's the whole ballgame. So that's the book. And that's why I thought it was important. Wow. Okay. That just answered a lot of questions for a lot of, a lot of people's insecurities were like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. This is why I overwork. It's true. Though. I feel like society just slams it into your brain that you have to be so productive and you have to get so much done yes. to be anybody. Yes. And then the flip side, the, you know, the flip side has been in the last seven to maybe 10 years, seven, eight years for sure, is that the way, the pathway to wholeness is to divorce yourself from all systems of productivity. Right. And it's that, that real life is found in self-care, et cetera. Like, so we've swung, we've swung to the other side of things that, that an experience of, that we're so afraid of burnout. And I understand that, that like, well, I just won't, I'm going to divorce myself from these systems entirely or try to. And I think that's a miss as well. Yeah, no, life can't be, I cannot measure my life and the goodness of my life um, by like my, like how well I meet the bottom line of my productivity. I think that's, that's a recipe for all kinds of disaster. Um, and I can't measure my life uh, either and the goodness of my life by how well rested I am. Like these things work together. Um, in rhythm, that's why it's called sacred strides. It's kind of a wonky image, but, uh, these things work together in rhythm so that I would live fully alive and flourishing and beloved. Okay. It's, it's not, it's not even that it's both things. It's that both things are growing out of a deeper, deeper question that I'm asking, which okay. is, am I actually loved? I love that. Wow. Okay. I feel like we could go for days about that. Amen. Yeah. You could write a book about it even. Did. <laughs> I love it. You're everything. Like I said, I love that you are, especially in this world, like my generation and below, I feel like, and this is going to be an incredibly broad way to word this. I could be more specific, but just to kind of paint a really broad picture. I feel like we're separating, like I said earlier, mental health and like self-care. It's all about self-care. No, it's all about this. No, it's all about this. No, it's all about, and everybody's kind of on their own little topic and their own little island. Yes. And I love that you're kind of comparing and you're putting them all together. You're, yeah. you're smushing them together and saying, hey, you know what? You can do all of this and build a whole. And I love yeah. that. You don't have to yeah. be on one island. You don't have to believe in, oh, just mental health. Oh, just Christianity. Oh, just self-care or whatever that may look like. So yeah. I think that's really cool. Yeah. The way okay. Augustine the way Augustine pl puts it is he talks about human desire that ultimately, and I'm going to miss the quote, so I'll just summarize it. U ultimately, Augustine says that, it, that if we really do chase, follow our desires, like in actuality, that we will eventually discover God. Like if you actually pay attention to the things that you're wanting, like really pay attention, like what is it that you're wanting? All of our desires stem from the deepest desire, which is actually to be in union with the divine. That's where it all comes from. And if I believe that, which I do, then I actually have the freedom to pay attention to what it is that people are pursuing and instead of cast disparagements on it and be like, you're an idiot. Like you spend 35 hours a month out on that stupid bike that you spent eight thousand dollars on it's like well why does he spend an eight thousand dollars why does he have an eight thousand dollar mountain bike and why is he out for 35 hours a month well maybe because there's something in that experience and the exercise of his body that draws him to that deep sense of belovedness and belonging to nature which i would suggest is rooted in who he's created to be etc if we chase our desires if we truly follow the thread from what it is that i'm wanting whether it's to be well rested or to achieve great things in the world at the root of all these things is the desire to be in union with the one who made all things that is the i want to live beloved if that's at the root of all of it i love that absolutely i think it kind of preaches the same thing and where my podcast and my whole mental health move that goes to is none of us want to be alone and in the end we all want to be loved and kind of like you're preaching we all want to be beloved we all want to be whole we all want to be yeah. so that's just so i love 
seeing these things kind of preach the same thing. It's really Amen. cool seeing. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate all that you're doing and all that you're doing for your followers, for sure. I know you're providing a lot of inspiration. You've gotten quite a bit of following uh, this last couple of years. So that is so neat that you're, I mean, all of your words are just hitting so many people at home. That's so cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So you kind of mentioned this earlier, but what is next for you? Um, a few things. Well, um, today's the 20. 20- First, so uh, this is the shortest day of the year. Thank God, I'm done with. <laughs> I'm done with. I'm done with it being Dogger Four, homie. Oh my uh, gosh, I'm over it. Um, I get to take some time off and hang with my kids. It's my favorite thing to do in the world. Love. My pleasure. Yeah, yeah, Justin. Thank you so much for joining. I could. I feel like I could talk to you forever. You've got a very soothing voice. Well, I appreciate that. We'll do it again then. Let's do it. Listen, when you come out with that new book, we're going to hop back on. We're going to chat about all of those things. It has been such a pleasure. Everybody, you know how this goes. Justin and I are going to continue chatting for a little bit. You can find the extra questions on my Patreon at patreon.com slash Townsend Team Music. Hop on there. That is how we keep this mental health train going. That is how we fund this project. So get on there. You get some really cool things. If not, we'll see you next week. If you'd like to hear the rest of this interview, Visit patreon.com slash Townsend Team Music. And don't forget, you can also watch the interviews on our YouTube channel at Townsend Team Music YouTube. Selena with Impact Coaching and Consulting is a certified life coach who helps women find harmony with their faith, family, and career. She offers a virtual goals workshop, mastermind group, and a one-on-one private coaching where she helps you identify your deepest purpose, develop a roadmap to reach tangible goals, and encourage you to overcome any obstacles along the way. Selena's worked with hundreds of business professionals throughout the United States, including small business owners, direct sales associates, chiropractors, financial advisors, real estate agents, doctors, professors, teachers, and many more. You can follow her at coach underscore Selena on Instagram and Impact Life Coaching on Facebook. You'll love the encouragement and the practical tips for finding harmony in your unique life.